As the map of Cheyenne appeared on the screen, Major Grimm zoomed in on a set of buildings downtown. As it stands right now, we have a deal with the local city council in the area to keep our military operations outside of their city. Other than routine patrols in the area, our military presence is kept to an almost non-existent minimum. This is because of an attempt, misguided as I believe it to be, by the governess and brass to try and build goodwill of the citizens through autonomy. Gesturing to a building downtown, she continued. Due to this, like a days ago approach to our security, a small rebel group has set up shop inside the Yellow Zone in the former Nelson Museum. From the outside, they just look like squatters, but they managed to signal-proof the building to a degree that Orbital can't assess what is actually contained within the building. With the GPR and the thermals have failed to pick up any activity inside, this by itself would be annoying, but paired with our man Vincent Ketter being seen entering and leaving over the past two days, the evidence leads me to believe something has been planned, and I do not fucking like it. Tapping a button on her Omnipad, she highlighted a building to the north of the museum. The only viable position for proper Overwatch is on top of the old boutique, where Team 1 will be stationed. Team 1 will have the goal of assassinating our mark while making it look like it was pulled off by a rival rebel group. Team 1 is composed of Slip, she said, gesturing at the diminutive Shulvanti woman, and Adam. They will operate as spotter and sniper respectfully. Following the assassination, the local garrison will be allowed to investigate the murder, like they would any other by the town council's own accords, up to and including facilitating a thorough investigation of the building. She finished the last part with a predatory grin. Now, for the ladies of Team 2, our job is to land north of the city and pick up a car that's been left for us by the local garrison. We will then move to support Team 1 by acting as a quick reaction force in addition to the Exfil, she said, swapping her hand across the Omnipad, zooming in and laying a route from the landing position to a location within the city proper. Then the image zoomed back in on a building to the northwest of the indicated museum, highlighting it in short order. Ferry, your goal is to drive us in front of the Lamy County Circuit Court building and hold there until Team 1 radios us for extraction. The briefing continued on with needless details for Adam. His mission was simple. He get dropped off with Slip on the roof of the boutique with a sniper rifle, stay in concealment until he spotted the quarry, and then put a round through his skull. Easy in, easy out. He did note, however, that Ferry's face seemed to sink at the prospect of being the group's wheelman instead of Adam's part in crime. You can really blame her. He'd been a little disappointed at being paired up with Slip initially, but he reasoned that if he would be working with the team for some time, he'd better get used to operating with all of them. Slip, for her part, was diligently paying attention to the briefing, pausing to take notes on her Omnipad periodically. She noticed him looking her way and flashed a smile before returning to her task. Moving his gaze around the room, he saw Popper being, well, what he expected of Popper, being a finger halfway up her nose, completely oblivious to anything going on around her, other than the briefing, which she was trying desperately to pay attention to, but clearly her eyes were beginning to glaze over at the Major's unending details. Looking to the final person in the room, whom he had found out was called Classy by the team, or at least Popper told him that's what she was called. Her long black hair was pulled into a ponytail, as she had a stony gaze set upon the Major, clearly focused on the data that was being delivered to the room. Supposedly, everything about her background was classified with Royal House level codes, and was eyes only. When she wasn't wearing a helmet, she always had a simple black half-face mask pulled above her nose. Her skin was a dark purple, only a couple of shades lighter than the Major's, and the only time he had ever heard her speak was through her helmet's built-in voice scrambler. Shrugging off the thoughts of the strange woman, he returned to the Major's briefing. In short order, she finished her spill on the road hazards that might exist in the Yellow Zone around Cheyenne. Alright, I think that's about it. Any questions? She asked, clearly hoping to not have to answer any. Popper, being Popper, raised her hand. The Major sighed and said, Yes, Popper, you can go take a shit now. Actually, Grim, I was wondering how we're going to make it look like rival insurgents, she asked, covering a point that Grim hadn't touched on, but Adam already assumed. Simple, she replied. We already have weapons and knowledge provided by a former rebel himself, with a wolfish grin. She gestured at Adam, drawing all eyes to him. He grinned back at her, straightened out, and smiled in return. When do we start? Standing in the arms room, nearly 40 minutes later, Adam looked over Slip. She was now wearing his plate carrier and carrying his AR. She wore jeans and a long sleeve shirt over her Shulvanti armour in an attempt to look less like a marine, and more like the distance they were impersonating. You're staring, she said, sounding slightly nervous. Yeah, just making sure you look the part. If it wasn't for the purple skin, you could easily pass for a human at a glance. 
and replied. That's not a compliment, she murmured. Eh, I don't know. I imagine that all the boys back in Shill dig the track star aesthetic you have going on. I don't think Ferry or Pop could fit my carrier, that's for sure. That statement, intended to be friendly by Adam, elicited her spinning around to face him, closing the distance between them, and pointing a dagger to his throat. Listen, fuckhead. I'm not about to take that shit from some stupid male who thinks he's all that just because he was in the right place at the right time, she said, staring daggers at the taller man. She stiffened slightly when she clearly felt Adam's own knife pressed to her side, primed to enter her right side, just between her second and third rib. Adam had drawn as she aggressively spun around, now being allowed his knife, handgun, and AR-338 back for the mission at hand. She clearly was not used to being counted in a close fight like this, and Adam had her in the grips of mutually assured destruction. She lowered her knife from his jugular, and he pulled his from where it sat pointed at her liver. Maintaining eye contact, Adam tried to broach the subject in a more cautious way. Listen, I don't know what has you so riled up, but I'm sorry for saying it. As of right now, we're going to be stuck on a rooftop for somewhere between the next hour and the next few days. So let's clear the air. I'm the new guy in the team. I've been there before, fresh out of Rasp and Ranger School. This part of our operation is your baby. I'm just the trigger man. I'm not going to hold a grudge for this, but we need to spend the time we're stuck together focused on the mission and not trying to kill each other. Get me? He said, maintaining her gaze and standing to his full height. Fine, she said with a shrug and predatory smile. But we hit the sparring ring as soon as we wrap this up. I want to see what's got Ferris Clam so soaked over. Noted, he said, picking up his sniper rifle and gesturing to the doorway. Shall we? The next two hours passed smoothly. Adam and his team piled into the armored and customized shuttlecraft, and they were currently en route to Xi'in. Night had fallen over the city as they approached the small city, still suffering from rolling blackouts, and most of its twinkling lights dimmed or extinguished when they made their final approach. The intercom cracked alive when the pilot spoke up. ETA to target building, 30 seconds. Green light to open bay door. Slipped in miss a beat, reaching to the door from where she sat across from Adam, and brought a handle on the door in and back towards her. The icy air blasted in from outside with a deafening roar. Adam lifted his rifle out of the exit of the vehicle as they circled the city. The chill armourer had attached a handy clip in front of his scope that could toggle it from night vision to thermal, a combination of the two, or unaided vision. It was small and light, and appeared to be an extension of the scope tube at first glance. At the moment, he had the combination mode on, and was dutifully scanning the area around the building, now at his drop zone. Sid wore a pair of what looked vaguely like sunglasses, but were far too thick to function as such upon further inspection. They functioned much like his thermal optic, but in addition, they had a heads-up display that showed friendly positions, and the general area of friendly, enemy, and unidentified personnel by the ISR operators in orbit. Damn, I gotta get me a pair of those, Adam thought, as he glanced at the woman, who was clearly in her element, leaning almost out of the door with Adam's rifle at the low ready. Returning his charge, he scanned the landing zone for a couple more minutes, and decided they were good for dropping. Major, LZ looks clear on scope, we should be good for drop, he said, pressing the push to talk, a face with chest rig. Got the same over here, said Slip, confirming his thoughts. The Major pushed her left hand to the side of her helmet, paused and nodded. ISR says the ground looks clear from their end too. Pilot, bring us in for a hover, two metres off deck. The Major responded to their assessment. On it, boss, the pilot responded. Adam's stomach lurched into his throat as the craft banked and dived into a 45 degree angle towards the rooftop. The descent was fast and steep, only altering the trajectory 100 metres or so off the ground. The pilot banked and Jay hooked the craft over the rooftop, staying put just long enough for Adam and Slip to disembark. Slip landed on her feet and probably fell back on her rear end, clearly not used to the weight of a human plate carrier. Adam, for his part, landed, tucked and rolled sideways, bringing himself to a kneeling stance. Pilot, take us to Station 2. Team 1, good luck down there. We will notify you when we are on station for QRF. Pod 7, actual out. The Major's voice cracked through Adam's headset as he moved to help Slip to her knees. You good? He asked her with a quirk brow. Yeah, I am. How the fuck are you moving these things? They're so heavy. When I saw you in Ferry on feed, you were booking it through the mountains I like nobody's business, she replied, shuffling the armour on her chest. <laughs> you get used to it after a few thousand hours of wearing it, he said, turning away from Slip, now satisfied that, at least physically, she was fine. Not fucking likely, she muttered under her breath, as she fell in behind him. Together, they moved to the southwest corner of the building. Slip leaned up against the small parapet wall, setting a small camera from her belt pouch on the top, and pulling out her omnipad before adjusting it a couple more times until she was satisfied. Adam sat up a few feet to her left, the suppressor 
another addition by the helpful Shulvanti armor on the frigate, was positioned about a foot and a half behind a one foot by one foot drainage hole that just happened to give a decent vantage point of the front of the building they were set up to observe. Staying focused on the rifle scope, Adam watched the front entrance of the building in companionable silence with slip for well over an hour. Their rifle still hadn't made it into position, and so they just continued to do nothing but wait and buy their time. Then a man stepped out onto the steps in front of the abandoned museum, lighting a cigarette. Adam recognised him instantly, but double-checked his Omnipad, just in case. His target had arrived. 